Okay, well, it is two o'clock officially, so we are going to go ahead and get started. I'm sure that the people will uh, continue to come in as uh, the seconds and minutes pass by. So, um, hi, welcome everyone to maintaining robust access to services through the Student Service Student Support Hub. Uh, my name is Sochi Tirado. I am a faculty mentor with CBC and a faculty member and DE coordinator at Imperial Valley College. Before we begin, I would like to let everyone know that we have two sign language interpreters in our meeting. They are Stephen and Joanna. Uh, I am now pleased to introduce you to our wonderful facilitators, Jim Julius, Angela Cardinal, and Lene Whitley Putz. Uh, Jim Julius has been the faculty coordinator of online education at Miracosta College since 2011. He collaborates with faculty, administrators, classified professionals, and students from across the college to help online education support uh, Miracosta's mission of success, equity, and caring for students. Currently, he also serves at Mir as Miracosta's Academic Senate Coordinating Officer, ASCCC OERI Liaison, and Faculty CTC Pathway Grant Coordinator. If you'd like him to talk about something other than online education, ask him about soccer or California's native plants. Angela Cardinal has been the Faculty Coordinator of Online Education since 2018 and an English professor since 2005 at Chafee College. Her work focuses on improving and supporting teaching and online learning for both faculty and students. She also coordinates and leads faculty professional development around online teaching, as well as the day-to-day -day operations of the Digital Equity and Innovation Hub, a space for staff, students, and faculty to access teaching and learning resources. In her other professional life, Angela has most recently published work in the Los, Los Angeles Times, McSweeney's Internet Tendency, and the Anthology One Team. Lene Whitley Putz has a PhD in Rhetoric and Communications from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, where she studied the ways women in grassroots movements were using emerging web technologies. She currently serves as the Interim Dean of Online Learning at Foothill. Prior to this, she has She's, she had the enormous privilege of working with the CBC OEI professional development team and at one, where she led peer online course review and worked with amazing faculty from across the California community colleges to develop robust, meaningful professional development to improve online teaching and learning. During the webinar, we will also be linking to a survey for you to provide feedback. We'll be dropping a link in the chat at 30 minutes and then every 15 minutes after that, we ask that you fill this out to let us know how we did and so we can create programming that is more tailored to the needs of our system moving forward. Lastly, while At One offers badges as proof of completion for our courses, we do not provide a badge for attending this webinar. However, if your institution requires proof of attendance for flex credit or professional advancement, please remain until the end of the webinar, complete a survey and request a copy of your responses to be sent to you through the Google form. You can use that confirmation as your proof of attendance. Now, without further ado, I turn it over to our wonderful presenters. All right, thanks so much, Sochi, and everybody on the CBC team. We're really glad to be here today. Um, and thanks everybody for showing up and, and uh, we look forward to engaging with you if you haven't yet opened your chat, please go ahead and open the chat window. Um, there's three of us presenting, so we're always here to answer your questions or, or engage in some back channel. Um, and please introduce yourself. We're curious to know what colleges are, are represented here and what kind of a role you have at your college um, that brings you here today. So please, um, as I begin, don't hesitate to, to start using the chat. So, uh, this is the second of a two-part series. Um, we did a, a presentation two weeks ago on introducing the stu Student Support Hub, and we shared a resource document, and I'm going to just go ahead and um, give you that link in the chat as well, and I'm going to open it up because I just want to make sure you know what's there because there is some pretty useful things there, and we will continue to add to that. So there's a link, and let me just very quickly demonstrate what's here. It's got uh, a link to a recording of the first session, as well as a link to the slides from this 
from the first session. There's a link to slides from today, and we'll change this registration link um, to be a link to the recording once that's available. And then there's some resources. There's a link to a survey that we've invited folks to take over the last couple of weeks, different from the one Sochi was just talking about. That's a survey evaluating the webinar today, but we also are gathering data about hubs and their state uh, across the California Community College system. So if you have not yet responded to that survey, we'd encourage you to do that. The, that link is there. Um, we are also gathering public facing examples of student support hubs so people can start looking at those. There are Canvas examples as well as college website examples and we'll keep building that out and, and adding more as we hear more about more and receive more examples of public, publicly available um, websites. There's also links to some of the CVC support resources that have been developed over the years for creating a student support hub, which includes, uh, there's a, a template to the, uh, to the hub that MiraCosta originally developed with CVC that's in Canvas Commons. There's also a whole technical guide to building a student support hub. The three of us are really not going into technical nitty gritty at all because all of that is already there, but you can always reach out to any of us as well if you, uh, you know, want more details. And in many cases, we may connect you with the person who's most responsible for those technical nitty gritty details at our colleges. There's a couple cool publications that have mentioned um, the hub concept that I think if you're still sort of selling um, your folks at your college on, those may be useful as well. So I just wanted to, to give you a quick look at some of the resources that are there. So what we're, we'll be doing today, I'm going to do a quick recap of some of the key ideas that we uh, shared in our first webinar share some data that's already come in on that survey that I just mentioned. And there you can see the link. And um, again, I already added the link in the chat for the resource document, so you can hit the survey from there, but I may share that link again later. Um, we'll talk, we'll get into a bit, little bit more detail about our hubs in terms of the services that are there, or maybe that are not there in some cases, how we support and maintain our hubs, the technologies, the staffing, and just a little bit more of the realities. We also really want to hear from you all. We're hoping to, to end with time uh, for some robust Q&A. And even we can turn over screen sharing to folks who, if you have something unique in a hub that you've been working on at your college that you'd like to share, we're hoping to have some time to, to potentially do that at the end. So in terms of the first webinar that we did two weeks ago, um, we just gave a little bit of background about the Student Support Hub concept that was really developed about eight years ago, seven, eight years ago as a concept, um, and CBC championed this idea as a key element of an online ecosystem supporting student completion and success. Um, the original Student Support Hub was a collaboration between CBC, OEI, and Maricosta College, and we launched that in 2019. Some of the design principles behind a Student Support Hub, how it's different from a typical college website, it's very action oriented with minimal text and maximal opportunities to get to the key resources and ideally the live people that uh, can help with whatever the, the question, concern, uh, or just engagement opportunity may be. Minimal clicks to get there, minimal scrolling. A consistent experience is one of the ideals that can be hard to live up to as we uh, link from our hubs to various services, but that's still an ideal and a principle. And then equitable design. And what I mean by that is just design that uh, is easy for uh, all of our students to engage with, that's representative of diverse student backgrounds and, um, and mobile friendly to the greatest extent possible. So I just wanted to share a little bit of data to begin with that came in. We've had about 20 responses to our survey about the status of the Student Support Hub, and a little over half of those indicating that there is a hub in Canvas at their college at this point, and about 15% saying they have a web page on the college website that serves as a hub. So I think there's still a lot of room, if this is representative of our system, for folks to continue um, building out this concept, which we think is really valuable. We also asked what services are represented in those student support hubs. So you can see that there's a lot of responses here with, with a big grouping of, of responses that most folks have. 
Um, I thought it was interesting that none of these were a hundred percent, but you know, tutoring is very common. Library services are very common. Academic counseling. Really happy to see basic needs support is something that's extremely commonly found in our hubs. Uh, career coaching and transfer advising, technical support, of course, is one you'd expect. And then some of these other ones, uh, like admissions and records, financial aid and student disability services. Um, I, I'll mention this again in a minute, but I just am excited to see how many colleges have that because Miracosta doesn't. And it makes me think, huh, here's some data where I might want to go back to those folks and see if they might like to be part of our hub. And then there's a few others here um, with less than half representing, but still pretty interesting to consider, I think. And I think it would be worthwhile just to, to point out a few of the open-ended responses that seem fairly interesting or um, just we really asked about who's responsible. And we'll talk about this for ourselves a little bit for maintaining um, student support hub pages. And it varied a lot across the responses, but you know, particularly if the hub's in Canvas, then that responsibility is very typically with distance education, faculty, or staff. There were a couple of colleges that talked about having forms and workflows, but most colleges who've responded to the survey so far indicated they really don't have any clear process. And so I think for a lot of us, that's something we can aspire to and something we may be talking a little bit more about in detail. Um, Many colleges indicated they've continued online services that expanded during COVID-19. I was really glad to hear that. I was a little bit, one of the reasons that we put that question in the survey, we wanted to know whether colleges have had to pull back on what was offered through their hubs post COVID-19 and you know, as colleges try to create sort of a return to campus. But it, the, the primary responses were really that they have, colleges haven't been doing that and that just having that hub has been a win and Folks are finding that to be really important to maintain. Challenges that are common across many respondents include tracking of data associated with uh, usage of the hub, maintaining current information in the hub, and just the, how uh, new services might be added. And those are all things that we'll definitely be talking more about from our own um, perspectives as we go forward. And definitely invite you to share thoughts in the chat along the way. So. I'm going to jump into Maricosta College a little bit. And so, again, I, I did a demonstration of our hub and kind of walked through a, a, a fair bit of how it works during the first webinar. So I'm not planning to do that again at the moment. Um, but here's a screenshot of what it looks like. The services that we're currently offering there include academic services in that top portion, library and uh, various tutoring services. Um, more holistic student support services, including academic counseling, career coaching, basic needs, and health services, um, and then uh, some tech support options down here at the bottom. But as I mentioned, we don't have uh, admissions and records. We don't have financial aid. We don't have student ability services. Here. And interesting to go back to those folks and see if they might want um, to be represented here. And I'll just say, as I mentioned that, you know, even asking those questions and questions in some cases is an opportunity to reopen eyes, even at once a hub is already established on, on your campus, there may be a little bit of siloing that happens in how that works and student services writ large and individual student services may kind of forget that the hub is a way that they can connect with students. And so I think even asking those questions from time to time of your services that aren't represented there is a good way to maybe again, crack open a door that helps, um, helps it become less siloed in the big picture. Um, so how we have added our services, we had a very kind of systematic approach pre-launch of the hub, pre-2019. We had lots of communication and engagement. I was going to student service leadership meetings. We were creating special meetings. I had uh, a couple partners from our tutoring center and from our library and from our counseling, uh, academic counseling department who were all engaged with me in the work, who were um, part of that, that outreach, who were uh, helping lead those meetings. We had CBC folks coming to our campus and um, meeting with different leaders from these different areas. And so there was a lot of intentionality and engagement. But really, once it was launched, then it's all been very idiosyncratic. 
we definitely have added services over time. So we're not, we, we haven't been static, um, but how those services get added, sometimes they reach out, sometimes they've heard about it, sometimes we reach out to them, um, but it, it really hasn't been, um, you know, very systematic. But there was a cool moment last week that happened in a meeting that I want to share about um, for a few different reasons. Um, so this is just kind of recreating a scene from a Zoom meeting. Um, it, the Zoom, the the meeting was our uh, Miracosta College Student Success, Equity, and Guided Pathways Advisory Group. It's a group that I sit on, and and part of even why I share this is I I think it's critical for folks in distance education leadership or as it's called at Miracosta Online Education Leadership, to be in these kinds of spaces. Um, when we should be out of our DE silos and engaged in these kinds of opportunities to, because you know online is so integral to the work of our institutions at this point with so many of our students taking online classes. And what I've always said about something like the Student Support Hub, it's there for all students. It's not just about meeting an accreditation requirement for you know, uh, equivalent services online. All, nearly all of our students um, love the opportunity to engage with online tutoring when it's 10 at night and the, the on-campus tutoring centers aren't open and most students aren't you know, gonna look to be on campus, but they're doing their homework. And if that's available to them in that moment, that's great. So that's just an example of you know, why I think it's so important that we continue to advocate for this. So in this meeting, we were having a discussion about how students engage with a quote, a cohesive support experience across their student journey. And so as I do in these kinds of meetings, I bring in the online perspective and just say, we're, we're moving towards online pathways in this context of like guided pathways and such. So it's important to make sure there's not an assumption that the supports that we're talking about, this cohesive support experience, doesn't uh, sort of default to the idea of a student being on campus and engaging in that way. And it led to this um, kind of back channel Zoom conversation with folks on the side. So Jenya Lenstrom, she's our associate dean responsible primarily for guided pathways. And she makes this point about um, the bundling of supports and bundling is a big guided pathways word right now. The bundling of supports for a fully online program would also embed student and academic services that are available in the online modality. And you know, I wasn't even really thinking about the hub necessarily at the beginning of this conversation. But when Jenya said that, I was like, ooh, yeah, I got to bring up the hub. I've got to you know, make sure that this is on the forefront of folks' minds. Before I even could say anything, Wendy Stewart, who is now our chief idea officer, um, you know, inclusivity, inclusion, diversity, equity, and access, she's part of this committee as well. And she's she was formerly a dean who oversaw our academic counseling area. So she says, I agree, Jenya, we are having discussions about not just brick and mortar centers, but how we can create parallel digital centers. And that really sent off the alarm bells, like we're gonna create this? No, we, we have it. So I just say, let's talk about how that relates to our student support hub and Canvas as you have those conversations. And I shared the link to the Canvas student support hub here. And I just wanna put in a plug, a number of you who've responded to our survey said your hub is in Canvas, but it's not publicly available. You know, it has students have to be enrolled in the Canvas course and then they can access it. And it's just a setting. And I really would advocate you to consider flipping that setting in your student support hub if you have one implemented in Canvas or if you're working on it to make it public. Because then you can do things like this, which is why I think it's so important that, you know, if somebody, if I want to share it with somebody internally, let alone you all, I love being able to share it more widely too. But for that internal sharing and people can just click on it and go, oh, I see what it is. That's cool. I didn't, I forgot about it or I didn't know about it. Um, that's really important. So then Wendy says, um, uh, absolutely. I remember working with Adrian as this was being put together. And Adrian Askernis is the uh, counselor from academic counseling, who was a big part of launching online counseling, both at Miracosta and he really partnered with CVC as well. So he was a big part of creating that hub, which was like five years ago. So it's great that she recalls that, but you know, I would love it if this was more on the forefront of her mind as well. I say it's still going strong, always open to how it can evolve. And then Gregorio, who is a student equity student support specialist, wonders how do students get introduced to this? 
through their onboarding to Miracosta or through Professor Syllabi? And I'm like, yes, this is the great questions. These are this is what I want to be hearing from folks to, to understand this. So I, you know, let him know that, you know, we require it's one of the requirements of being an online, if you're teaching an online class, a distance education class, that you make students aware of online support services. And so every semester, you know, I'm always sending out those reminders to our faculty who are teaching DE classes and really to all faculty. These are online support services. You should be promoting them. And, you know, the easiest way to do that is just by making sure that when you're helping students understand how to navigate through your Canvas class, that you're pointing out that link in the Canvas navigation to the student support hub where they can get to, where they can access those great services. Um, so I mentioned that, and I also mentioned um, that we have our student online academic readiness workshop. That's a student readiness workshop for, for online learning um, that I lead. And um, I did mention this workshop in the last session, and I think I misspoke and said, um, 1,000 to 1,200 students a semester. It's per year. So let me correct that. But that might still be interesting to some of you. So I'll just mention that um, part of how we get that kind of attendance is that we've set up a system where I record attendance at that workshop in our student information system. And faculty are able to pull that list of attendees. So it makes it really easy for faculty who think that's important for their students to have that kind of opportunity to incentivize it, say, by uh, by um, providing extra credit. So we've got a number of faculty who really, really like the um, what it does and how it helps their students. And so they incentivize their students. So we see a lot of students coming from those um, classes and those faculty in particular. Um, but I also say, I think there are opportunities for even broader and more coordinated promotion, which again is just my, like, there are other kinds of opportunities opportunities that I know the student support hubs not being mentioned in other kinds of orientation and support um, spaces. We have particular student support programs that I know do a great job of talking it up with students and others that I think are really not very aware of it. So um, just a, an opportunity there to continue to, to try to plug it with somebody like Gregorio who sits in a lot of those spaces where he can then help folks understand that it should be plugged. So just a final couple notes on, on our processes. Um, so we have an online instructional technologist who was the one who did the original Canvas development, um, turning the design that I had worked on with CVC into a reality in Canvas. And she's still with us and, and still does an amazing job of interfacing with our different service areas and ensuring that information is up to date. But it's not particularly systematic. Some service areas are really proactive about giving her information so she can update that. Others need to be asked once in a while. And it what I, what I kind of had a light bulb about when I was reading some of the survey responses was that an automated workflow um, would be pretty cool. If there were forms that were automatically sent out to remind people to check their information and update it, there could be somebody in the, in the workflow who is reviewing um, the wording and making sure it, it's consistent with our principles in terms of keeping text really minimal and very readable. Um, so I think that's still an area where we can improve. Um, also just, you know, we don't control the, what the students experience once they click through the hub into that space where they're getting service, um, from, from a provider. So that's, that's always, I think, going to be the case with a hub. That's kind of part of the definition of a hub. Um, but, you know, in an ideal world, I think we would try to be on the same page as much as possible about the kinds of technologies that were being used, the um, the approaches that our different service providers took and how they interacted with students to give that um, for our students as, uh, as consistent of an experience as possible. We still don't really have a formal plan or process or guide for how any of this should work. It's still just pretty ad hoc. Um, and as I've kind of was already mentioning, the promotion of the hub is still really driven by us in online education. We can put announcements in Canvas, we can send out emails to faculty, um, but we would love to have more um, buy-in across the college um, for, for that um, promotion. All right, so thank you. And I'm gonna turn it over to Angela now. And Angela, do you wanna share your own screen for your yeah, part? Yeah, I'm ready, I'm ready this time. Uh -huh. <laughs> Go for it. I've also, I've been sick for, I don't know, a month now, so I will try not to cough through this, but um, it's not COVID, but uh, I will apologize in advance. Um, okay, so 
uh, I just want to give you a quick snapshot of our hub, just as Jim did before we get into some of some similar themes. Um, so we have these areas in our hub. We initially used the Miracosta design and we're very grateful to Jim for sharing that with us. Um, and this is where it's evolved to now. <clears throat> so we have, you see like admissions and records that was not in there um, originally. Um, and we've broadened our student support programs, but at the same time, we've sort of held to those principles of, you know, being able to take an action in minimal clicks. Um, we've also added a few things like Canvas guides and video how-tos that we know students readily need, and then the help desk information there. So that's what it looks like. And then let me jump back over to the presentation. Okay, sorry. I'm gonna try that again. See, this is why I had to have Jim do it before. Okay. All right, here we go. <laughs> um, so our, um, let me go to the slide show to you. So uh, key services and support, the ways that, that we kind of developed this were to find models elsewhere. That's really helpful um, rather than just trying, it helps for proof of concept. So shout out to Miracosta there. Um, and to find counterparts at other institutions to support problem solving. A lot of people feel that their work is unique and it is, and they have unique concerns and questions. And so putting them in touch with counselors at other institutions that have already done this sort of online work was really helpful or librarians or whatever their counterpart is for problem solving so that it's not just me as an English professor rolling in with all this, the solutions, no one wants that, right? So it helps with credibility. Um, using institutional research data to assess and demonstrate need and regularly reassess really helps drive the conversations forward um, because you're really looking at what does the student need, where are their gaps, and what do we need to address, and that really motivates people to um, kind of uh, take action. Uh, we also um, started small, so I think it's really important to find faculty and manager champions in you know, minimal amount of areas that you can work with, and if people don't feel excited about it or don't want to work on it, then that's fine, right? It's voluntary. So just kind of work with the people that can work with you. And then you can build momentum from there because once people see the work happening, they want to participate. Um, and like it says there, work with people who want to work with you and the others will follow. I think it's really useful. You know, we all want to have it, the ideal situation before we launch, but that's really not possible. And especially when you're working with so many cross-functional areas. And so I think working small and building from there and being okay with it being imperfect and an evolving process is really key. Otherwise it'll just never launch. And we know that from working at every college. So on any project. Um, so some steps to including key services. So establish and communicate within your, I think it is really important for online education to have these internal conversations first before taking it to the other areas. It's really important to kind of establish and communicate clear baseline design criteria within your team. Um, so we, of course, action oriented, minimal clicks, similar looks and platforms when possible on each area support page and et cetera. So what is really essential to be part of the hub um, right, because you want to go around and tell the areas like these are our principles, and if it, you know if it fits, that's great, and if it doesn't, then we'll help you get there if you want. Um, I ended up just presenting to everybody all the time, and it, you know this happened right before the pandemic that we launched our hub, and at first it was seen as sort of um, I think a like an overwhelming or even out there idea. Um, but if you just keep repeating yourself in as many forums as possible, it starts to seem like normal. <laughs> and then and then once the pandemic helped it along after that. But I think going to the key areas, guided pathways that Jim mentioned, DE committee, academic senate, student services, counseling, library, everywhere you can, marketing, and just making it seem like this is where we got to go. And it's exciting. And then that sort of built momentum there too. Um, I was very creative about, like, I couldn't get certain faculty to think about what their presence would look like online without um, paid training. So I was able to find weird grant money. Um, there's always weird grant money um, to incentivize the training um, and also to support our development of our, um, of our hub itself. Uh, but I think there's a case to be made that this is an equity initiative. And so there's equity funds, there's always some grant out there that you can do. And then once people did the training, then they were on board and moved forward. So. Um, it's also important, so we have a picture of an ideal workflow that is not implemented yet, but it is a nice workflow picture. So we're still working on implementing it, but I think thinking within your team of what is a workflow ideally for how, when, and who will update, what will marketing look like, who are the point people in every area, and how are you going to get that information regularly? It's super important to have at least an ideal that you can work towards. We're not there yet because it's so many areas that we're coordinating with, but it's helpful to have. 
So I do have a very pretty picture of that. And I think our instructional technologist Adriana is on here and she made this, um, but this is what our ideal is. Um, and that would ensure optimal student experience and integrity of and access to the hub, um, ensuring all stakeholders feel invested and confident in their role and presence. So I think people, you know, trying to coordinate a very siloed institution, right? Um, to all feel like they know what their role is and, and when to update and they're not duplicating work and they're not using too many different platforms. That is a challenge, um, but it's really important because we want as much as possible to have the students to have a seamless experience, right? Um, so this is really important. So we have this workflow here and you can see um, it's color coded, right? And so at the beginning, you know, all the areas are collaborating to define the need and the audience and purpose of the participation. Um, an area identifies their point person, um, and timeline. So we want the, the areas to take ownership of their presence, right? And so we would help guide that and have those conversations, but at certain points, the area itself would be establishing certain things. Um, the area would identify platforms in collaboration, of course, um, can establish a consistent look and framework in collaboration, um, agree upon access and you know equity and accessibility. Um, one challenge, which I'll point out on the next slide is we have a lot of faculty professional development, but we don't have a lot of professional development for our staff and administrators. And so when we say, you know, the design should be accessible and there might be staff working on it that have never had training in that, that's a problem. And so that's something we're still um, facing, but it's still super important. Um, and then the area develops a plan for regularly ensuring student verification if that's necessary. Um, and develops a plan for communicating this resource. So marketing, as Jim said, you know, we're constantly, when someone says they don't know about the student support hub, it like hurts me um, personally. And so <laughs> I'm always trying to think about how can we market this to students and faculty and make sure that everyone has it at the forefront, right? So that's something that you wanna have a strategy about too, if you can. So this is not in place, but I think it, it's an ideal workflow for us at least that we're working towards. Okay. So I have some challenges and opportunities. At first, the slide was called challenges and it didn't have the opportunity side. So I'm like, let's do both. I do think that they are opportunities and the tremendous amount of growth we've seen in online presence in the last five years is very much exciting, right? Um, but it's still a challenge. So we've had a lot of turnover with manager and staff institutionally, which leads to gaps in those workflows, right? So we have new people on board all the time and then we're, they've never heard of the Student Support Hub so then it's starting all over again. Like, what is this? Who's updating it? All those things, right? Um, so with established workflow and updates, this can be readily com uh, communicated. So we don't want it to just live in our heads. We wanna have an established framework for how do we communicate this to people. Um, it's not a DE initiative so much as an institutional need, but yet it is, <laughs> A DE initiative. And so it, it kind of pulls on our workload sometimes. And so that's something, um, <clears throat> but I think that's an opportunity because we have the opportunity to teach people about user experience and design principles and accessibility that influences the presence of other areas, you know, even on the website or even some of the work they're doing in person. Um, unique cultures, workflows, and experiences with technology in each area particularly between student services and instruction, make it difficult to establish a consistent experience sometimes. Um, so we're constantly, you know, and there, there is sometimes even friction around that. And so I think that's an opportunity for collaboration and reduce siloing, but maybe that's a little uncomfortable for people sometimes. Um, like I said, staff and administrators here have fewer professional development opportunities. And I think this can bring the light to need for this. And I'm constantly talking about, let's do user experience training and auditing and accessibility training and UDL and use of technology. And so I, it's a point um, that I'm advocating for, but that we're not, we haven't really addressed yet. And then we have had the uh, experience of staff and faculty feeling frustrated, overwhelmed with the rapid changes in work, the pandemic, all that stuff. But with appropriate support and leadership, I think that can be a growth opportunity and you know, distance ed or online student support services are not an add-on, they're a vital, essential part of what colleges do now. And so we have to move forward and evolve with that um, as the change as, as our institutions change. So, all right, so that's what I have, I think that's it. Yes, okay. I will give it to Lene. Thank you. Maybe you will. I think I've already lost it. Hold on one second. Sorry.
I would think this is the first time I've ever shared my screen. There we go. Sorry about that. All right. So, um, you know, just as kind of like a, a summary from last time and to kind of reorient you, um, we decided to go uh, for uh, like more in our student hub than um, the absolutely amazing template that was shared um, by Miracosta. And that's because we were in like emergency mode. And so um, we had the COVID push that um, gave us that real impetus to put more things online where students could actually access them. And so we have a combination of areas that are just information, as well as the areas where you can actually get in and do um, what needs to be done. So we divided it up into uh, three different areas, and they're kind of loosely co combined around um, services first. So we have our academic offices, which is admissions and records, financial aid, counseling, transfer, and testing. And um, most of those have actionable things that you can do that way streamline um, what's happening on the website. For instance, the admissions and records um, link in the student support portal is immediately linking you to things that you can do. And if you go to our website, students have to click down like multiple layers before they can actually get to a doable action. And so our thought there was just to streamline things as much as we possibly could. Um, the next section is uh, around support services, which are technical help, tutoring, wellness, disability resource center, our veteran center, EOPS and student affairs. And all of those are really areas where we have a lot of student interest and needed to get that information to students as seamlessly as possible during COVID. And then we just continued to maintain it once we got back to campus because we discovered that we weren't really ever going to be back to campus in the same way um, that we were prior to COVID. We've often asked ourselves um, since the kind of return to campus, do we want to move these around and maybe put support services at the top and academic offices below that? But what we find is we get a lot of questions to our technical support line and um, over half of them are actually about admissions and records, financial aid or counseling. Um, so we handle so many things in online learning that are not related um, to actual Canvas issues or online learning issues. And so we just figured let's get that information to students as easily as we possibly can. And then we have one more section, which is additional resources. And this is really where we do some community building. Um, we discovered at the beginning of COVID that we always ran announcements at the top of our Canvas dashboard. And we used EasySoft before it became impact and part of um, Canvas. And so we ran regular um, videos and things like that for both our faculty and our students. But during COVID, we got a ton of requests for impact messages or for announcements on Canvas, um, like an overwhelming number of them. And we quickly realized that there, we needed some kind of community hub. And so we do things like um, in the student support portal, we announce uh, when we're going to have um, our associated students' um, elections and things like that. So we can run them at the top. We, we call it an announcement, but it's actually not a Canvas announcement for the class. We, we build in a little banner and we put something special in it. And people are constantly asking if they can be the banner on the first page of the Student Support Hub. So we kind of like um, that there's a, a sense of community that is built around our hub. Uh, one of the questions, uh, oh, I just want to reiterate everything that Jim and Angela said, that um, managing the content and getting it consistent and everything else is the challenge. So staying current is a huge challenge. Um, and it's like something that you have to have a, a method or a pattern around, or you'll quickly find that you have pages that are, are way out of date or broken links and um, missed information and things like that. So it is kind of like you have 
the information on your website and then you have this other source of information and you need some way of making sure that the information is current. Um, we also found that that spot at the top of um, our page was wildly coveted. And so we had to have some way of figuring out how it should be used. You can only have one thing there at a time or um, it gets overcrowded and that that then reduces the power of, of the hub. And so um, we had to work with our administration and our marketing department and um, even our associated students to figure out what exactly would go at the top of that page. Um, the other thing we found is that personnel move around a lot. Like even if they don't leave the department, the chores that people do shift. And so we thought that we had like a regular person that we were touching base with about um, certain pages on the hub. And then it turned out that they had moved into a different position. So staying up to date with uh, who we should be contacting in each area can be a big challenge. And then we also argue even amongst ourselves what should be at the top of the hub and what should be included in our sections in the hub. So right now our library is actually down in our community area, even though the library has a lot of actionable things in it. And the reason for that is because there's two other places in Canvas where students can access the library. And so we just thought maybe that super important ground needs to be um, reserved for someplace that doesn't have other saturation points within Canvas. And it's a super hard decision to make. And we're never sure that we've made the right decision. So we revisit it on a fairly regular basis. One of the things that we got a lot of requests for um, in our survey was um, how we maintained uh, a um, tutoring page that can be updated by the tutoring center rather than us. So I just wanted to show you really quickly what we did. We created a Google slide and we called it our tutoring schedule. And we put all of the information about the tutoring schedule on that page. And we set up the slide the first time ourselves and then shared it with the tutoring department. And then in Google Slides under file, you can just select share and then publish to the web, which is what we did with it. And then um, once you publish it to the web, you can select either a link or embed code. We chose the embed code. Um, and then also um, we discovered that we have we have three different tutoring services as part of our tutoring center, one specifically for STEM um, students. And then we also have a Pass the Torch, which is for first generation students, and then our language um, and writing lab. And so uh, we made different slides for each one of them, but then you have to set it up as a slideshow and then it will rotate through those three. However, uh, that is not uh, ideal design where disability is concerned. Um, having slides that are constantly rotating that people can't stop is um, not the best user interface um, feature. So we then were cramming all the information onto one slide, which is what you saw. So we suggest that you put it on one slide if you can, don't start the slideshow and don't restart the slideshow and publish, okay? And then um, make sure that you share that uh, slide then, the ability to edit it with the group that you want um, to maintain um, the slideshow. So it's very easy in the editing permissions. And then use the embed code in your Canvas page. So it's actually very, very simple to create a page that can be dynamically um, kept up to date by the group who's keeping it up to date. Ironically, um, when I went back to the instructional designers at um, Foothill and Paula Shales is our designer that maintains this, um, the hub, it, they do 99% of the work on the hub and I do 99% of the marketing and getting people um, to actually participate and know what they want to do. So when I went back to Paula and, and made sure that I captured her flow right, she said that they had just this... Um, quarter changed it back to Paula doing the page because there was so much information. The um, the different 
people running the different tutoring services were having a hard time keeping the formatting looking nice and it was driving Paula crazy. And so she said that she'd rather go in and, and update their hours on a regular basis than answer their questions about the formatting and making sure that it was accessible. So there's two things you have to weigh. Like, do you have a person who's super detail oriented who can make sure that their, uh, you know, our tutoring hours, we want those to be exactly up to date all the time. Um, so that's our process um, for how we create that dynamic um, information. It was very easy to do it, and it might be a great way for you to kind of start some of those dynamic pages like hours that might change. I mean, during um, some parts of the quarter, ours change every single week. Uh, so that's it. Awesome. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Angela. Thanks, Lene. Thanks, CVC folks. And we do have some time. So we would love um, to have some conversation at this point, hear from you all with questions. If anybody has a hub that they want to show off and, and um, share, we'd, we'd love to see that as well. Um, yeah, go ahead, Jen. Hey, thank you all for all of this. Um, I have comments, questions. I apologize for being all over the place because this is such an important topic. At City College of San Francisco, we have a student hub in Canvas, but we also have other areas of our college that have their own hubs. So that's been just, that's just a challenge. I'm curious if anyone else has had that where we have like our equity office that has their own hub and, and it's all doing the same thing. And it's, it's really hard because we just want to streamline for students, right? If students have multiple hubs that all look different, right? Because in Canvas, it has a particular look and feel. If it's on our webpage, it has a particular look and feel. And then there's this wild PDF flying around as well that is also a hub, which makes me cringe because it's PDF. And you all D folks know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Imagine all of that on a PDF. So I'm wondering if anyone has experienced that, any advice yes. around that? <laughs> well, I, so I was making some notes as um, as Angela and Lene were speaking, and that was like the one thing I wanted to make sure to touch on is that I don't, I don't think there's a perfect answer. And if someone can correct me, that's great. Um, but I've kind of resolved to live with that. And um we're in the same exact boat at Maricosta. And I didn't mention it, but we have our student services offices. And in fact, our vice president of student, student services is really bought in to the, and I just checked it today, 27 page PDF that she personally sends an email to all the faculty every semester and says, please include this PDF in your courses. <laughs> and it is like the opposite of those principles of the student support hub. There's so much scrolling. There's so much reading. How are you going to find exactly what you want? How is that organized? Um, our website has at least a couple different places that you could consider a website-based hub. And I, I think we meant, we talked about this a little bit in the first webinar. I think our student support hub has had some influence on how our websites are designed that are sort of like hubs. They're, they're very tile oriented. They're very like um, always putting the, the links to talk to a live person above the fold without a lot of click, without a lot of scrolling, the information is down below. So um, I did just go, I was invited to a meeting last week where the college was uh, hiring a consultant to redesign the homepage of our college website. And when I'm sitting in those kinds of meetings and listening to people that really know what they're talking about with user experience and websites and such, one of the fundamental questions is like, who's your audience? And I feel like that all those different things actually kind of have different audiences. Although we would like to think that our students are our first audience, a lot of times the audience for our college website and those kinds of pages are other staff and employees. And and for that PDF, I don't, I don't know who that audience is actually. It's, it's like the people that create it wanna see it and think it's cool looking, I think. Um, don't quote me on that, but but we know that that Canvas-based student support hub is for students, and we actually know that you know most of the time when students go there, if we want to do role-based things within there, we know that there are students that are clicking on that because 
they have that role in Canvas. So I think that gives us a power with the Canvas-based student support hub to really know this is for students and therefore we're gonna design it in that way. And if other people wanna do other things, eventually maybe they'll come around and see that the student support hub is, is the best place. And if it's public, maybe they even start linking to it from more and more places rather than sending people elsewhere. But that's kind of how I've resolved that in my own head is that, okay, you know, I can't change that other people wanna create those other things, but we can keep making the student support hub student focused. And if, as long as we keep kind of reminding people of its existence and showing them how it works, then that's that's kind of what I sort of have resolved to to be happy with at this point. We had a um we had an online an online support center and then our student support hub and then a student toolkit all kind of doing similar things and you know only one of them and yeah so there's a lot of duplication there and um I we ended up being able to advocate because Senate would send people to this the toolkit I believe and it was a lot of duplicated stuff and no one was really maintaining that if someone had worked here and started that and then left the college and so there was a, an issue there and everyone's well-intentioned right but it's just a lot of duplication and confusing interface for the students and so we were able to then get them to redirect them to the support hub. But we had to go to a lot of meetings and explain why and all that stuff. And so it is possible, but it does take time. And it's very, um, I feel a very high sense of urgency when our students, I know that they're navigating and hitting dead ends and all that stuff. And it's it's um, a little bit frustrating. It doesn't move more quickly than that, but it is possible to influence. Um, but we still have that divide between instruction and student services for sure. It's good to know that I'm not alone. It's not just a city college thing. There's a lot of things that are kind of a city college thing. And yeah, and I don't think we're going to, like you said, I don't think we're going to solve it. So I'm just kind of trying to collaborate more with these folks. They are also in student services and just educate and hopefully get, get rid of the PDF because it is not accessible. <laughs> and they're like, the way they're going to print it out. They're printing out links. I, I don't know. I'm just having a hard time with it. <laughs> I think if you can have data that like do kind of a needs assessment about, do you know about these services? Where do you find them? And then bring that. Cause I've found as a faculty member, a lot of managers of other areas don't care to hear my opinion about that sometimes. Um, and so, and I've had four different managers in five years. So that I don't have that direct sometimes, but if I can do needs assessments and demonstrate, look, this is a real thing. It's not just my feelings. And you know, this is, these are the reasons we want to change. And we have great news. We have a solution for you. Here's all you have to do. That's helpful. Yeah. Thank you. What other questions are on folks' minds? Lynn, yeah, go ahead. I have a question. Uh, so we are just getting started and, um, we're putting together our hub. We also have, um, city labs design plus, which I think is going to go a long way to help us with the design. Uh, we do not have an instructional designer. It's all going to be made by the DE team. Uh, I do have the student services people on board, the tutoring people and the, um, office of academic affairs, but I wanted to ask who other than those three would you say would be my um, first tier foundational tier of um, people to try and bring on board? I'd say library. That would be that would be top of my mind. How about okay. others? Because I did write down that whole list that that you guys had tutoring, library, counseling, basic needs, career and transfer. And I want to start real small. I want to start because I think we need to show how it works um, and get, you know, do some sort of pilot with students, maybe over the summer or in the fall so that we um, and then maybe can add all the rest of those. But Do you have we, interest from the managers in those areas? Yes. Okay, yes. good. Yeah, I. Uh, it was after your first meeting, and then I had a meeting with them where I told them all the amazing things that everybody else is doing. <laughs> I think so, yeah, the managers the, are on board. 
Yeah. One really great thing to do is um, to show people um, other schools hubs and uh, that might get them excited. Um, our, uh, Jim wrote in the chat that they used, oh wait, that's, that's Jennifer that wrote um, that they used design plus. And when we created our hub, we did not have design plus, but we do now. And so it's kind of on our list of things we want to do is like, oh, wow. You know, we, we could do something way different now that we have design plus. Um, so I think that that will help you, but if you show, um, the managers of the different areas, what other campuses have done in their area, Okay. Then they're going to get kind of excited about it. And once you have idea. a couple of them up and running, then those don't say like, well, we're not going to publish the hub until blankety blank, publish it. Because once it's in Canvas and, and you walk into a meeting and you open up Canvas and say, can you imagine if the students who are coming to your service were just able to, from Canvas, se select this button and you know, open up access to your service, but, but then people go like, what, 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 wait, can you show me that again? It's like, you can say it, but until you show it, it's, yeah. um, it's the game changer. That's terrific. Okay. Perfect. And thank you, Jen, for your design plus version. That'll be helpful for us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I was I was thinking the same thing. Demonstration is really important. Let me just show you. I mean, in our student support hub, our librarians were one of our first partners. Their tiles right here up at the top. Oh, and by the way, I was mentioning earlier about the student online academic readiness workshops that I do. I do those in partnership with the library because they were, you know, for a long time running separate workshops that were like introduction to library resources and nobody would come. Then they found out that um, they could hitch a ride with my workshop. So I give them the last five minutes of my one hour workshops and they just, it, I conclude with showing the student support hub. So I just hand it over to the librarians and they show what students can access from the library resources right here in the student support hub. So right up, so again, keeping with the theme of action orientation and connection to people Right at the top, they have their library one search, which searches across all of our library resources, and then they have the 24 seven ask a librarian. So those well, two things. And the embedded web page into Canvas. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it was a little tricky. I mean, so there's yeah. some technical stuff to figure out how to do that, but the mm -hmm. shows it can be done right. And then, you know, if you scroll down, there's just four little tiles with with some of the key resources that students might be looking for when they're hitting the library site in, in the Student Support Hub in Canvas. Um, and I, I did have one other question just real quick about your SOAR workshop. You yeah. do that uh, as an online workshop or a face-to-face a -face workshop in your library? Yeah, so it... When it first started, it was face-to-face -face in the library. That was like 10 years ago. And then I started doing them synchronously in Zoom as well. And the, the attendance for the face-to-face -face got so small that I had already, even pre-COVID, pre was already only doing one or two in person. And I haven't actually post-COVID returned to doing any in person. Um, I've been talking with some other student support folks about a different approach for students that really, really are basic, but are trying to do something online because that workshop is, is not a good fit for them. And once in a while you will get students coming in who are just at square one and, you know, they ask a million questions and the workshop can kind of go off the rails because they just need such, such basic beginning. So I think we need a different path for folks like that. But I think most of our students at this point are really fine with doing the, the online piece and it gives them a lot more flexibility to attend. Thanks. Sorry for that off question. That's totally fine. <laughs> so Danielle, there is, um, the original one is available in Commons. So let me share one more time the link to the, um, to the support resource. So if you go to this um, support resource, which is the long link that I just put in the chat, there is, if you scroll down on that page, there's a link to the uh, Miracosta, the original one that we developed with CBC that's in Commons.
It looks like we probably have to wrap up, Jim. Oh, you're right. Wow, it's 2.59. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, thanks everybody for being here. Yeah, I really appreciate your engagement and thank you to my co-presenters, Angela and Monet. Any final words from either of you? No, thank you. That's exciting, Lynn, that you already got so much engagement so quickly. So yeah, if anyone has questions, I think we're all happy to share because I've, I've benefited greatly from people sharing with me, so. Ditto. Thank you yep. so much, uh, Jim, Angela, and Lynn for presenting this uh, wonderful topic and thank you for every everyone for attending the webinar uh, and giving the facilitators your full attention once again please look at the chat for the survey link and that's our survey our cvc survey uh, just to get your feedback on this webinar and help us plan for future webinars if you experience any issues um, with your verification of attendance you can always uh, send an email to support at cvc.edu. And we also hope that you register for future webinars. We have a few more, uh, you know, coming up, uh, just a few more to end the semester. So if you just go onto our at one website, you'll see our 2024 list of webinars that you can uh, register. Um, and one last thing is that this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on our at one website. So you'll be able to find the recording and I believe also the uh, PowerPoint, um, the slides to this presentation. And that is it. I think the survey has been dropped, been dropped more than once. So hopefully you had a chance to get it. There it is once again. Thank you so much, everyone. And once again, thank you to our wonderful presenters. Um, really, really great job. Great topic.